Right, let's start. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this webinar on queer migration. My name is Borisov Gerasimov, um, and I work with the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. GW is a is an international feminist network of NGOs um, that advocates for the human rights of migrants and trafficked persons. And we are based uh, in Bangkok, which is where uh, I am at the moment as well. Uh, and before I introduce our uh, speakers today, um, let me say uh, a few, just a few uh, introductory words about this webinar. Um, so one, one of the uh, activities that we do at uh, the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women, or GW, as we um, is, say for, uh, for short, uh, is uh, we publish um, the Anti-Trafficking Review, which is uh, the first open access peer-reviewed journal, which focuses on the issue of human trafficking in its broader context and intersections with gender migration, labor and development. We began publishing the journal in 2012, um, and we publish two issues per year, each of which is dedicated to a specific predetermined topic uh, and has a guest editor who, who has significant experience uh, in this topic. So today's webinar is dedicated to the most re recent issue of the journal that we published, uh, which was titled Migration, Sexuality, and Gender Identity. I will paste in the chat. Um, uh, OK. I am pasting in the chat box uh, the link to the, to the special issue where you can read the articles that we will be discussing today and also uh, the other articles whose authors uh, couldn't join us. Um, all articles are open access, as I said. Um, so we, uh, the webinar is planned for about one and a half hours. We, our contributions will be maybe one hour or a little more than one hour. And we hope to have 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers at the end of the presentations. Um, so, uh, Okay, just a moment. I see my panelist here. Um, so, um, you know, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you wish. Um, and to ask questions throughout the webinar, you can ask questions either in the uh, with the chat box or using the Q&A button uh, here on Zoom. Or if you are watching this on Facebook, we will also be monitoring uh, any questions or comments there. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, let me introduce our speakers today. We have Swati Shah, uh, Associate Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the US who is also a research associate at the Department of Anthropology, Archaeology and Development Studies and the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, uh, Jacqueline Sanchez-Taylor, who is a senior researcher in sociology at the School of Law and Social Sciences, Royal Holloway University at the, in the UK. Valentini Sampetai, who is a PhD candidate in social anthropology at Pantheon University in Athens, Greece. Shakti Nataraj, who is a lecturer of sociology at Lancaster University in the UK. And Tokozo Ingwana, who is a researcher and PhD candidate with the African Center for Migration and Society at the University of David Batres Rand in South Africa and Ekaterina Rostovskaya, who is a master's student in human rights and humanitarian action at the Paris Institute of Political Studies in Europe. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here uh, and for, uh, of course, for writing these amazing articles um, in the special issue and for um, coming to this webinar to, to speak about them. So I want to give the floor to you, Swati, first. Um, 
if you can just say a few words about uh, the, the theme of the issue, why, why was it important and timely to devote a special issue of the journal to the experiences of LGBTI people with migration, informal labor, asylum trafficking, and so on? Oh, yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um... I'd be happy to do that. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I will just make a few remarks about um, what I think is the significance of this issue and its theme, but I will start by expressing my deepest thanks to Borislav Gerasimov and GATW for providing the, the platform and the incredible support for putting an issue like this together. I, this was my, uh, this was a, a wonderful experience for me as a guest editor. And I have a feeling that this will be the best experience I ever had being a guest editor for a special issue. So um, thank you so much, especially to Bobby for making that happen. Um, I also wanna thank our incredible um, contributors to this issue. I am extremely proud of what we've uh, accomplished. I think that um, this issue represents the state of the field in a way that um, I was kind of blown away by um, the breadth, the depth, um, the, the representational uh, uh, power of the issue to kind of talk about um, where we are as a discourse and as a debate. Um, what One thing that I'm particularly happy to see is that um, I think the, the issue represents both people who are new to the debate as well as veterans uh, who've been around and talking about this since the late 90s. Um, and I'll kind of start with that substantively as one of the, the the ways that I think this, this special issue is significant. As we all know, um, and as is attested by the, the amount of time that organizations like GATW have been around, this debate has been going on for a long time. And when I say this debate, I mean the debate on sex work and human trafficking, um, the, the problematic of conflating trafficking and sex work, the, the question that a lot of people have about what the relationship is between migration and human trafficking, what the policy response should be. Um, so I think what this, this issue does is it, it reflects um, collectively a very um, long engagement with some of those problematics. And one of the things it's able to show is the ways in which that debate has changed. One of the ways that debate has changed, of course, is via um, you know, the way the world has changed. Um, one of the things that we were interested in tracking here was the ways in which compared to um, when all of this started, so to speak, at least in its, its uh, current form and its, its currently legible form in the, in the 1990s, is that um, there is a lot more legibility in, at least in, in policy, as well as um, in certain academic spaces for thinking about sexuality and gender outside of its heteronormative frame. So that has a, a significant impact on um, the work of those of us who've been trying to talk about things like transactional sex, irregular migration, informal economies, we now live in a world in which um, queer and transgender asylees and refugees are uh, much more juridically legible, um, are object of policy interventions, are um, being talked about in academic research. Um, and that kind of a, a new form of legibility requires new forms of critique and new forms of um, research engagement. So one of the things that I think this issue was able to do was kind of reflect on what that those new forms of legibility in these various discursive arenas mean. The other thing that I think this issue was able to do um, was uh, to really engage with questions of material survival in relation to these new forms of 
juridical legibility. So while uh, we do have all of these new uh, categories of uh, personhood, of sexuality, of gender identity that we can deal with in research, we're still saddled with some of the same old problems that many of us were talking about you know, 20 years ago. And I think the biggest problem that is unfortunately consistent in all of this is the, um, the kind of the, the deeply um, individualistic uh, kind of liberal individualistic way that uh, sexuality and gender identity get framed, that they continue to be framed as um, aspects of the individual body and individual bodies are seen as uh, coherent units that um, exist outside of something that we would call the social. So uh, one thing that I think this special issue continues to try to advance is a much more um, socially embedded uh, materialist understanding of um, how we might think about sexuality and gender identity. Um, the third point I'll make is related in that um, something that has been pretty consistent for those of us who've been working on uh, questions of, of sex work, human trafficking, migration, informal economies for a long time is that we're not not interested in um, the individual, we're not not interested in the affective, but we are interested in how these things are embedded in, related to, structured by, what have you, questions of materialism and, um, and attendant questions, excuse me, of political economy, um, of the material world, of, of what anthropologists call worlding, um, of the, the ways in which the world is, is, is an interactive um, project and that uh, that interactive project includes um, the material. So um, I think what we do, you know, some might call it intersectional, others might call this processual, uh, regardless of the terms that we use and the frameworks that we use to understand how all of this fits together. I think that um, this collection does a good job of, of kind of giving different examples of how that project might be accomplished. Um, I'll quickly say a couple of other kind of broad um, things that I think we have accomplished here. One is I think that um, we've done a good job of um, not only existing within the empirical nor the theoretical. I think that we've done a good job of kind of talking about it all together. Um, there's something here for everyone. Um, there are, are, there's a deep policy engagement. There is a deep theoretical engagement. Um, there's, there are discoveries, if you will. There are, are, are new research objects um, that are being um, put forward. And by that, I mean critical objects, not objectifying individual people or communities, but there, there, are, new, um, th there are new critiques and new objects of critique that are being produced here that um, I don't think easily conform to either the empirical or the theoretical, and that's always a good thing. Finally, um, I think what we, we did and something that I think needs to happen a lot more in the literature is I think that we were successful in um, advancing an understanding of migration as a rubric for transactional sex. And for myself and for my um, fellow authors in this wonderful issue, um, for us, that does not mean that we are advancing migration as um, structured by a kind of unfettered individual notion of freedom. That's one thing that um, I think has unfortunately been one of the successes of conflating um, trafficking and uh, sex work is it sort of um, produces migration as a, a kind of a, a very new, in a very neoliberal sense of you know this thing that people do because they're happy and they migrate and they're you know they're like free birds that fly around and they that and actually migration is a very human activity and it is an activity that is related to very complicated issues about power about survival about kin networks um these this is a a for lack of a better word, a, a deeply structured activity in which there are 
choices that people make and there are also constraints in which people make those choices so i think that we've done a good job of of explaining the complexity of that rubric when we talk about something like transactional sex okay i'm gonna stop there um i again along with my heartfelt thanks to bobby and, and gat w i would like to thank all of the wonderful authors in this special issue, those of you who are here, those of you who, who couldn't make it, who I hope will see this video afterward. Um, you were just incredible to work with and I'm, I'm very, very proud to have been able to be a part of this. Thank you so much Swati um, for this uh, really interesting overview and I hope, um, I hope for everyone it's, um, it's an encouragement to read the, the issue. I, I shared the link to the um, issue with all the articles in the chat. Um, and, and now um, I, so for, for this webinar, um, because I, I wanted to invite as many of you as possible to, uh, to speak about your articles. So there's quite a few uh, speakers. Um, uh, but so we, uh, I, I wanted to focus more on the on the empirical, let's say, than the theoretical for for this webinar. Um, and so I've prepared a few questions for you all um, uh, to to speak about your articles. And and so the first one is um, my first question is um, why do LGBT people migrate? And and I want to clarify, of course, LGBT people migrate. Um, for many different reasons, like everyone else. Um, uh, but I, I would like you in your answers to focus on, on the people that you did research with uh, for your article, or if you would like to speak about uh, previous research or past experience, you're welcome to do so. And, and my second uh, sort of clarification is um, uh, that because the journal is, is concerned generally with um, with people who migrate into precarious working and living conditions or uh, people with less social capital. Um, you know, I'm, uh, the question is not so much about queer migrants like some, like many of us here are uh, in this webinar, but sort of these with more uh, precarious situations or whose rights are, are more often uh, violated in the context of migration. Okay, so with that, um, yeah, my first question is, uh, why do LGBT people migrate? And I will go yeah, call on you um, as you are on my screen, uh, starting with Jackie and after that, Shakti. Uh, yeah, uh, your microphone, Jackie. Hello, <laughs> and thank you for having me on this fantastic webinar. Um, we're, I'm not sure if we should have started with us because actually I would have said that most of our interviewees who were Jamaican um, people that were involved in the sex industry in various ways, um, mostly LGBTQ people, um, and really ran away. They, they were mobile because they were running away from home. And so they kind of entered into the sex industry because they were escaping um, homophobic home situations, homophobic communities, um, leaving families, her family homes which weren't safe in, in particular. Um, and our research then, we, uh, we did um, uh, ethnographic research interviews with 25 people, 13 of who were cis women, 10 who were cis men, and six who identify, um, and two trans women for biographical narratives, as well as working with um, the Sex Workers Association of Jamaica, who helped us collect survey data with 165 sex workers. And of those, we found that they're real high experiences of, of, of violence. Um, and in our interview sample, we found that all except three had run away from home due mostly to homophobia as well as poverty but thrown out um, of homes or they were orphaned and abandoned um, under the age of 18. Um, and so we wanted to kind of understand then the gap 
between how um, victims of trafficking are represented by policymakers and um, the reality of, you know, of the experience um, that we were hearing on the ground uh, and how they were uh, often labelled as traffic victims, yet none of them said that they were trafficked, you know, or experienced their my migration, their mobility as a form of trafficking, really they were escaping. Um, and there is a bit of a moral panic around the mobility of children who were constructed as being very passive, uh, and, but they felt that they were really taking control of their lives and, and you know, trying to make the best of a very bad situation. Um, so um, boys and LGBTQ youth, uh, especially those that have been going missing from home have recently started to appear in um, mainstream anti-trafficking discourse. And, been constructed as very vulnerable to trafficking now. Um, but this really hides some of the real reasons why they are moving. Um, you know, and, and instead, they're not looking at the kind of homophobia. So in Jamaica, homo um, uh, uh, home, it's um, homophobia hasn't been decriminalized yet, um, and sex work is still criminalized. Um, and as well, the you know, you have to put it into a context as well. So many people run away, not just because of, of violence, um, but because they are coming from very poor areas of the country, um, living with families that are really struggling to survive. Um, parents are often working multiple jobs, very low paid. Um, they can't afford to send them to school or pay for uniforms and books and this kind of thing. And you have to put this then into a wider context of how these experiences are really shaped by um, longer legacies of colonial exploitation, um, especially in Jamaica. You know, it's um, they've been placed since the 1970s um, into sort of into debt with the IMF, um, unable to really invest in their country, provide basic welfare um, or education. There's also rapid inflation, which kind of reminds us of what we're suffering now here in the yeah. rest of the Western countries. You know, it's like, it's quite normal there in Jamaica. It has been, that it's been, people have been living under those kinds of conditions for years. Um, and poverty rates have more than doubled between 19, uh, 2007 and 2014, for example. So, you know, people are really struggling to live and survive. So in that context then, um, as, as um, Javen Scott Lewis argues, this kind of geography of separation, you know, people are struggling to survive. Um, so I, I think all of, all of this are the, are the factors that push young people, um, and we're talking mostly um, children, but well, after we interviewed someone as young as 10, who migrated when they were 10, moved away to tourist areas, um, between, but usually between the ages of uh, 13 and, and 15 that they decide to run away and, and move and try and make a life for themselves somewhere else. Really so think that's my three yeah. minutes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Um, okay, next Shakti, and after that Katya. Oh, uh, the microphone. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So in the Indian context, what I found is both migration and what manifests as queerness is often in relation to the marriage economy. So it's a context where, as per the last census, like in 2011, um, there are 455 million internal migrants in India. The vast majority, like almost 70% of them, are cisgender women marrying, you know, moving within the state to their husband's home. So this is the, and, and, you know, this is also a context where the National Family Health Survey shows that 98 to 99% of people say they've been ever married by the age of 50. So marriage is deep, is, is marriage and kinship are the ways the economy is structured, you know, like if we say that some 95% of the Indian economy is 
supposed informal, but it's also structured in, in by very formalized um, norms regarding kinship and marriage and kinship networks are often the way people migrate and so forth. So for uh, queer people, often the pressure to migrate comes up when they hit the age at which they're meant to marry. So for example, you have lesbian women uh, in their late teens or early 20s who will often leave with their partner to the city and uh, and like uh, you were saying, you know, they are often construed as being without agency and choice and their parents file a missing person complaint. And so a lot of the activist groups I worked with would actually create materials to tell them, remember to take your passport, remember to leave a letter at the police station that you migrated voluntarily, et cetera. I did my research mostly with Kotis and Tirunangas. So Koti refers to a person who was assigned male at birth and identifies as feminine, but in the course of their life opts not to undergo ge gender transition. So they retain male presentation. And Tirunangay is the preferred term for transgender women, so who have transitioned. Um, and, and with these groups as well, often it's around the age where somebody is supposed to fulfill the responsibilities of being a son, you know, which is to ma marry and, and sort of bring a wife sort of to do unpaid labor in the household, basically. Um, and, and Kotis often have to make a difficult choice in their 20s about whether to migrate and transition to be to Dinangis, in which case they may forego a lot of the privileges they get by passing as male, uh, right from participating in the economy related to kinship, so structures of inheritance and so forth, but also the, you know, their educational qualifications, their employment opportunities, everything disappears alarmingly quickly when they transition to being female. So this is the kind of difficult choice that people make. And I think uh, if, if Tirunangas migrate, they often may join Jamaat structures, which are um, long-standing sort of alternative kinship networks within the trans uh, women community. Um, and, and, you know, with the rise of anti-trafficking movements, all of these kinds of migration also are seen often conflated with trafficking in a way that romanticizes and glorifies the birth family, whereas for queer people in many places in the birth family is a site of extreme exclusion and violence and unhappiness. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it's also an important experience that people have experienced many ways of being gendered in their lives. So a, a trans woman has experienced being gendered male at a certain point, and so, gender transition is equally an economic and you know social matter where they take all of these factors into consideration and as Swati was saying it's not just a neoliberal kind of internal experience that's then affirmed by gender transition but it involves all of these material aspects um, and regarding the moral panic about children that's definitely there here as well and has a long-standing base in colonial narratives of India as a site of sexual license or else a place where sexual agency doesn't exist or uh, degeneracy, et cetera. And all of those have been very strongly revived in the context of anti-trafficking movements. Great, thank you, Shakti. Um, Ekaterina. Uh, yes, hello. Um, so in my article, I focused on the experiences of LGBTQ asylum seekers in Russia, and um, I did, uh, I analyzed um, 12 decisions of first instance uh, immigration courts and, uh, um, well, appeal courts. Um, and I also based uh, on my own experience working with these communities for a few years uh, before um, I started doing research on uh, migration and sexu sexuality. Um, and so, um, in the cases that I chose for my um, for the analysis, um, all of the applicants were gay men, um, which is also interesting. I didn't, um, so I weren't able to um, find um, cases um, 
um, well, in the experience of uh, my organizations uh, with uh, women or trans people applying for asylum because of additional barriers that they face uh, both uh, in the process of migration, but also in applying for asylum in Russia. So um, all applicants for gay men from Nigeria, Cameroon and Sudan, uh, they all fled uh, for similar reasons, uh, fleeing um, violence that they experience in their communities. Um, in one case, uh, violence um, by uh, vigilance uh, groups uh, in Nigeria, um, but mostly violence within the family and within um, the communities. Um, and so I decided to focus on this topic because uh, during my work uh, with those communities, I realized that um, um, well, uh, Russia is not an obvious country that comes to mind when we talk about um, LGBTQ asylum seekers. Um, with the um, uh, recent history of the country, um, the adoption of the um, so-called um, ban on LGBT propaganda, um, and uh, the intensification of uh, violence in the LGBTQ community in Russia. Um, um, I was, my organization was still seeing um, the LGBTQ asylum seekers that were coming uh, to Russia and seeking our help in applying for asylum. Um, so it's also interesting to, um, um, that the reasons um, why um, LGBTQ asylum seekers um, come to Russia, um, they are different. Um, well, I already mentioned the reasons that um, uh, for which they leave their countries. Um, but in terms of the reasons to come to Russia, um, first, it's the fact that there are less administrative barriers. Uh, so uh, for many, and, well, for many of uh, the applicants in the cases that I analyzed, um, it was uh, simply easier for them to, uh, for example, come to study to Russia or uh, use other uh, means um, of traveling. Um, then second, what I um, uh, encountered uh, during my interviews with uh, those um, applicants is that sometimes they see Russia as a country of transit, uh, but some of them also um, see, um, so in, in their perspective, Russia forms a part of the Europe, is, um, in, uh, concept of Europe. So they come to Russia thinking this, that they would um, encounter the same attitude as they would expect uh, to encounter in Europe. And uh, the third reason is also uh, social ties. Although this factor, um, I think it's also interesting that this factor plays, I would say a bit uh, differently in the, um, uh, in the experiences of LGBTQ asylum seekers, because in one case that, um, uh, in the case of one applicant, uh, he specifically chose not to go to France uh, because he had family ties there. So he considered that he would not be able to live uh, as a gay man uh, in France, as opposed to uh, going to Russia where he didn't have uh, any uh, family members. Uh, but for many uh, other applicants, it was still uh, an important factor that they had uh, networks that they could uh, rely on. Uh, coming to Russia. So, and um, in um, in my article, I examine um, how uh, these applicants are treated within the um, Russian asylum system um, through legal through um, through analyzing um, the decisions. Uh, but also, I put it um, I examine it in a wider context of um, the, how the Russian asylum system operates. Um, and the Russian uh, politics uh, of sexuality. Thank you, Katya. Uh, okay, next, Valentini, and after Tokozo. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, yeah, so my research is with sex workers in Athens, Greece, and I, all, not all of my informants are immigrants, actually, or, or identify as LGBTQ. So basically, I worked with a mix of cis and trans local and migrant women. And I basically decided when I was in the field to look at different populations of sex workers together, because both in practical terms, I could see that they were sharing spaces and tactics, such as the strategies I'm discussing in the article as well. 
but also that mainly in an analytical way as well, they all kind of face um, different processes of, process of illegalization by state policy, part of which is migration, but it's not limited to that. So basically, I saw that hard and fast distinctions between who was a citizen and who wasn't were really difficult to sustain in the field. Um, so yeah, I became interested in seeing the connections between these groups of mostly informal workers who kind of met one another uh, in the sex industry. So basically, um, the kinds of migration and mobility I'm discussing are multiple. Um, for on one hand, for people who do identify as LGBT and are international migrants, but also internal actually, um, many of them would cite their trans status and also their limited ability to kind of secure a livelihood uh, where they were living before. So yeah, basically they would migrate for a mix of economic and gender identity reasons, which were kind of merged. And also anonymity played a role in that. Um, but it was interesting to see that, for example, for those who did apply for LGBT asylum, and that was their only way to become regularized in Greece, that the, the way they would actually talk about it or the way their lives unfolded, it, it wasn't this linear thing of going from a place where it's bad to be queer to a place where it's better necessarily. So, and also some of them actually planned to maybe return to their home countries in the future after some long-term migration trip. Um, so for example, one of my informants who is a Cuban trans woman who applied for asylum in Greece, um, she had done prison in Cuba on account of a mix of doing sex work and being trans or being legible in public space as such. Um, but then when she arrived here, she was also caught during a police check um, without papers before she managed to apply for asylum and was stuck in a detention center for ages. And then she was basically locked in this vicious cycle of, you know, showing up at the police station, um, having this gray area in her papers where she had a deadline to apply for asylum, but then she couldn't get an appointment. So she was in this really in a limbo basically in terms of her legal status and she knew it was only a matter of time until she would get caught again selling sex in public and you know that would ruin her chances for getting asylum so it would either they would either deport her or detain her so again she was facing a similar situation in some sense and in the end she actually fled Greece and went to Spain um, so again it's really hard to see the trajectories in a linear sense um so that's one thing and the other is that there's also all kinds of mobile work and mobility that happens within greece but also from people who are based in greece and then travel either abroad or to smaller cities apart from athens to get more work so there's a link between sex work and mobility in that sense and that has a lot to do with um getting work when the Athenian market becomes really saturated. So there's this constant need to kind of renew your services or to be a new face in a market that's constantly changing. So people actually do like seasonal migrations either within the country or abroad to work elsewhere. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, I think that's something that's shared among both people who identify as queer and not queer. So I was trying to basically look at all these kinds of connections and different kinds of mobility that are not necessarily LGBT migration mm. in and of themselves. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Valentini. Okay, and Tukoso. Okay, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, thanks again to GetW for organizing not only the issue, but this webinar. It's, it's quite good to hear from the other contributors uh, how they approach the theme. Um, this is very unusual, thank you. And um, so in terms of the question, uh, like Valentina as well, I didn't necessarily just focus on the LGBTQI plus persons. Uh, when I sent out the call for participants, I was specifically looking for uh, either current or former 
migrant or mobile or transient sex workers. So the migrant sex workers could have been either internal, uh, as in who have migrated from within the country, from one province to another, or from the village to the city, or external migrants uh, who had come into the country from outside of South Africa. And in terms of mobile or transient sex workers, I was interested in those uh, participants who actually move to South sex, so move around to sex, South sex, where by mobility is an important aspect of their selling of sex. So example of those would be the sex workers that work the truck routes, or who move to specific parts of the country uh, when there's like a big sporting event or some concert or change of seasons. So I try to encapsulate all those uh, mobile experiences as well. So I ended up with uh, 17 participants in total, uh, majority of whom were South Africans. Uh, I had about four from um, Zimbabwe and then one from Burundi as well. And then the ages were around um, from 19 to 42 years old. Uh, because I, I worked with uh, SWET, which is the Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force, and Sisonke, which is the movement of sex workers in South Africa, uh, my age group was strictly from um, adults and above because the movement itself only works with uh, adult sex workers or only recognizes persons that sell sex who are adults. Anyone below 18 is seen or considered to be a child who's being sexually exploited in the industry by the two organizations. Um, and in terms of their gendered sexualities, uh, those also ranged. So uh, I had um, five gay men, uh, four cis hetero women, uh, three lesbians, uh, two transgender women, two pansexuals, and one bisexual. And just to flag that, I didn't have any participants that self-identified as cisgender men. So uh, I had that kind of uh, combination of uh, participants. And the reasons that they uh, preferred in terms of moving uh, ranged also from socioeconomic reasons to escaping uh, family or immediate community, or even state prosecution. So um, many of the participants who self-identified as like sex workers, uh, first and foremost, they had indicated that they had left to look for other forms of uh, livelihood from their immediate communities or societies because they found that there wasn't any form of work or ways to make a living. Um, many of the participants uh, stressed um, that they had dependents to take care of. So that was an, an added strain to go out and find some form of um, income for the family. But there were those, actually it was one case where one participant did mention that when they came to Johannesburg from rural KwaZulu-Natal, um, and they had come up with a friend a friend had just said, well, you know, come to Joburg, let's see if I can't find you in work. But when they got to Joburg, they realized, well, the friend told them, actually, I'm a hustler and this is how I'm making my living. I sell sex. And it's up to you if you also want to do this work. But yeah, this is how I'm fending for my family. And what I found quite important about those kind of case studies, um, which is important for us to bring forward, is that it really just shows... Um, or rather demystifies the whole trafficking narrative, whereby even though this participant initially did not know that coming to Joburg would mean doing this type of work, when they did come to Joburg and were, were presented with the opportunity, they did take on that opportunity. Yes, it was based on their socioeconomic needs back home, but nonetheless, it should, that should not be used to take away the agency in having made that decision and so for me it was quite interesting to be able to engage with that kind of um, update of those kind of case studies to really show the nuances of, of sex workers movement and mobility and migration and also there were those uh, participants uh, one from uh, Zimbabwe who, who did um, relay that the reason why they had left their home is because just trying to find a quote might not manage to right now. But the reason why they had left their home is uh, because they do sex work, but more so because they are transgender. So it was also about escaping state persecution for their non-normative gendered sexuality. So I found that with migrant mobile sex workers, it tends to be um, 
a crossover of both socioeconomic reasons, but also the need to escape violence and survive, really. And I would say those were the kind of like the main kind of push and pull factors that uh, the respondents put forward as the reasons for, for leaving or moving around. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Ntokozo. Um, yes, and, and thank you all for uh, answering this question. I think, you know, the answer was probably, um, uh, I guess, uh, obvious to everyone that queer people migrate for economic reasons uh, and also to escape violence from the state or from their family, um, uh, violence, oppression, discrimination, and so on. But I think, um, you know, your, your articles provide really interesting and important um, uh, empirical evidence to, uh, uh, to support these issues. Um, and because we are going slower than uh, I expected, <laughs> I will, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, I will combine the other two questions I had uh, planned for you. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, you know, if you can, um, just des describe some of the experiences that you documented, the experiences of um, uh, queer migrants and, and in some cases uh, sex workers who are local, queer, trans, cis, um, um, migrant and non-migrant and so on. Just to, 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 to speak about some of um, uh, yeah, your research findings and to combine this with any recommendations, if you have, or any conclusions uh, that that came out strongly, um, and I will ask you to try to limit yourself to maybe five minutes max, um, so we can go around in the same uh, order, starting with Jackie. Hello. Um, yeah, so I think my research really mirrors a lot of what you've been saying as well the research i've did with katie cruz and, and julia o'connell davidson um i think in terms of experiences we were interviewing adults who were between the ages of 18 and, and 44 and they were telling us about their experience of running away as children or migrating as children to tourist areas and so their childhood spanned sort of from the late 1970s to the 2010 um, and they all started to exchange sex for money um, between the ages of 13 and 15 um, and initially for some of them this was for pleasure that they kind of had moved to tourist areas were finding and then found that they could make money out of their sexual um, encounters that they were having um, and often they found as well that lots of the intimate relationships they were having with older men also afforded them with some sort of security or home so they're very blurry kind of constructions there about you know how um how people started in the sex industry and what these relationships were for, whether they were economic or um, intimate or, uh, you know, what was that about? Um, but yeah, all of our um, data also shows that uh, there were the, these binaries that you have between that, um, sex work and uh, as being sort of something that's exploitative and sex for pleasure were just not that clear um in, in a lot of the relationships um a lot of our uh, all of our interviewees had experienced one or more of the following sort of labor exploitation physical violence rape was often um, very common especially among a trans and um lgbt um uh people who were working in the sex industry. And this wasn't just from clients um, or from the police or from the public, but it was also from family members. So a lot of them had run away because they had been raped. Um, uh, and, and some of, um, so that's, um, so their experience there between uh, the distinction that people usually make between home and um, as being somewhere that's safe and loving, uh, as many of you have kind of pointed out, and there's in the sex industry as being something that's dangerous and exploitative isn't always clear cut as well. And we had um, one interviewee, for example, who, who we call Candy in, in the paper, um, 
because she was um, she ran away from home when she was a teenager because she was raped by an uncle. Um, she went to uh, a tourist area. She was found by the police, taken back home again, uh, and where she remained until she was 16 under very difficult circumstances, living with a family that was quite violent towards her. And then she was ultimately kicked out again by her father um, for entering into um, uh, re relationships with men um, and so she ran away and when she ran away she um, she went to a tourist area and she made became friends with a woman who was 22 you know and that took her into her home and she was doing sex work uh, and she said to her you know if you want to come along you can look and see what's going on and uh, and she said that she made the decision to start doing sex work in order to help this woman that was helping her to look after her and providing her with a safe space and a home um and you know uh, and, and so she you know she wasn't pushed into uh doing sex work she was doing she was making an active decision to get some money so that maybe she could continue her education um and, and do something else um and yet the woman that was helping her would have been classed as a, as a trafficker you know and she felt you know that she was nowhere pushing her to do anything that she didn't want to do though which she didn't have very many choices and it's also the case that in jamaica because the homophobia hasn't been decriminalized it's very difficult for gay and trans people to find work to survive so then it's you know it's, it's sort of like a catch-22 they can't find work they're stigmatized by the local communities uh, and so sex work ends up being one of the only things that they can do so this sort of the distinction then between sex workers being something that's violent uh, and the home as being something that's safe is, is really problematic we found um and also this distinction between active and passive the, the way that sort of most trafficked people are constructed as being very passive in relation to what's going on we didn't find that either um so a lot of our stories all um kind of pointed to this um uh and if you um so in terms of recommendations then i would say uh, i would go with what our interviewees recommended first and foremost all of them said that um uh, homosexuality should be decriminalized and that all aspects of sex work should be decriminalized um they didn't want to be stigmatized any longer and they you know um and and they wanted safe spaces to be able to live and work and get access back to education so that they could have a choice in the future i think you know so um those are the the three key things I think that really came out from the interviewees. Um, you know, most, most of our interviewees migrated or were mobile within Jamaica because they were trying to find safe spaces um, to live. Um, uh, I would also say that it's really important for um, policymakers to start talking to sex workers' rights organisations um, and, and to fully understand the experiences of those who are migrating uh, and, uh, and, and find work in sex work, and especially the experiences of, of LGBTQ youth who find themselves running away and migrating because they're moving from unwelcome families and homes um, and there's a real need to stop reproducing a conceptual binaries around liberal thought where you kind of have those oppositions i think they're very really unhelpful um, and policymakers really need to engage with this ambiguity um, a lot more and trying to understand you know they want to understand trafficking as being something that's clear cut about these stereotypes don't they where you've got clear cut victims and clear cut perpetrators and then you can use law to criminalize people and capture the um, put them into prison and then everything's fine but when you're looking at lgbt youth in jamaica and their experience you can really see that this is a really complex experience um, and they kind of, it highlights so many um, interesting theoretical gaps as well, I think. Um, uh, you know, they are agents, um, uh, and even though they might be reported as, as being 
trafficked because they've gone missing you know it's the reasons why they've been missing are not taken into account uh, and i think you know we definitely need to have a, a kind of a, um, a much more honest and open debate about some of these issues so i think i'll leave it there because i don't want to go over <laughs> yes thank, um, thank you jackie just one quick follow-up um is there a push for decriminalization of homosexuality or same-sex relationships? I know, I think St. Kitts and Nevis maybe uh, one month ago decriminalized and Belize before that. So many of the Caribbean countries have been decriminalizing uh, same-sex relations. Um, there is a bit of a push, but in Jamaica, it's still quite slow. They, they, they're trying to work with it diplomatically, but it's not going as fast as it has, is. Trinidad and Tobago, for example, I think they're having real discussions. Um, uh, and I think it's still very difficult. It's an incredibly religious country still as well. And I think that those kind of religious groups have a lot of power um, in preventing this move. I think it will happen eventually. I'm just not sure when that could be. Um, and I recently went to a um, British Commonwealth uh, um, Institute meeting where they'd invited, so it was run by the British government, and they'd invited um, quite a few different people from across the Caribbean, policymakers, um, uh, and there was the head of trafficking from Jamaica there, and I did this paper, and 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 they more or less came up and were blaming the families for uh, bringing up, you know, poor children for children. Um, they were blaming the families for. Uh, children running away mm -hmm. and for not having enough control over their children um, and they really didn't want to engage at all with any discussion around the criminalization of um, you know LGBT rights or any of this so I think it's it's happening it will happen but I think it's still quite slow coming um, and I was quite shocked by that reaction you know that that kind of really sticking to um, you know, the kind of uh, language that's used in the tip report in the trafficking um, persons report, you know, sort of just really kind of sticking to those stereotypes. Uh, um, still, uh, there's a, still a lot of that at, at police level, at governmental level. Um, and I'm, I, yeah, let's hope that, you know, that there are people working away at, at trying to um, bring that down a little bit and change the law. Great, thank you, Jackie. Um, okay, um, Shakti, um, to you, your um, yeah, your 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 article is um, very much about uh, what you described earlier, how gender is also produced by migration and language and um, and caste and class and so on. So, can you tell us a bit uh, more about this? Yeah, so when I began my research, I was really keen to destabilize the seeming fixity of gender by looking at how it's socially produced in micro interactions. I, I use linguistic anthropology. And so there's the framework of how uh, queerness arises in relation to adjacent identities and so forth in, invoked by people in interactions. And this also helped me avoid uh, relying heavily on life stories, which I solicited, uh, because in the Indian context, I think soliciting life stories in an Indian in in a interview format from people marginalized on the basis of sexuality is a, is itself a social practice that has a really um, checkered past, you know, in the colonial period is being used to reify certain groups as criminal tribes. And, you know, since the 90s, especially, it's heavily relied upon by human rights projects, uh, health projects and research projects and community members are well used to kind of having a stark narrative for those kinds of events. And actually, the um, Tirunangay community, many people have started reclaiming those and doing auto ethnographies, uh, telling their own life stories in creative formats and so forth. So methodologically, I kind of tracked the social lives of life stories and sort of in, asked people in reading groups and seminars, you know, what they thought of this life story. I, I interviewed the author uh, to see whose stories they drew on. And, um, and yeah, what I found was that 
you know, just asserting a person's gender was not an end in itself, as though we just have an internal need to state our gender, but it gave value, both economic and moral, to other dimensions of a person like, person's life, and it had material consequences. And, and this for, you know, in terms of education, livelihood, uh, marriageability, kinship, and, and, you know, ethically what makes life count, like the cycles of merit and honor that count towards your, uh, you know, being a good person, really. And so, you know, people disputed the reasons a person migrated or the meanings of certain payments mediating that migration and thereby made an assessment of their gendered authenticity. So it was also a, a, a space where it isn't, uh, there was not a, a, a norm of just accepting a person's pronoun as what they wanted it to be. It was possible for people to continually assess and test and kind of as a claim that they they were not behaving as that kind of gender and so you're not worthy of me uh, using this pronoun to describe you so there's a kind of very intersubjective construction of gender so i'll give you an example so one of the short stories i analyzed in this actually was authored by a journalist it's a kind of uh, idealized story about a tirunangay life and how um this quote boy grows up and then you know moves away from his rural area to Mumbai, joins the Jamaat and so forth. So this journalist actually had interviewed a lot of Tirunangesu who he had in this anthology, but his story was markedly different from the interviews he conducted. And it it painted a, his name is Paul Suyambu, by the way, and his book is wonderful and, and people should read it. He's uh, really changed the discourse a lot. Um, but I looked at how he interpreted it versus how my inter interlocutors did. So in one scene, uh, when this uh, protagonist is moving from Chennai to Mumbai to join a Jamaat, the Tirunangis who hel help her don't take money from her for the migration. They don't take it either in the form of an obligatory gift, which is the kind of gift that would mediate, for example, a, a marriage. Um, nor do they take it as an expense, paying for expenses, rather they pay for it because they're so convinced of her femininity and chastity, and she moves there, and for the author, this, you know, reframing that payment in the story was able to remove her from, you know, narratives of trafficking, right, and then kind of place it as a kind of um, altruistic migration, but my interlocutor said that you know, that was really unrealistic, firstly, that you would have to share costs and also that heterosexual, seemingly normative families, also that marriage is heavily mediated by obligatory gifts and costs and is a thoroughly economic matter. And indeed, in uh, studies around cisgender women's migration, it is well documented that a lot of um, you know, the spectrum of practices that get constituted as trafficking, a lot are mediated by, by, uh, shit, sorry, timer, I was timing me <laughs> myself, <laughs> are mediated by <laughs> these kinds of, you know, uh, payments by uncles or fathers, you know, th th this often happens. So, I was thinking kind of as, as the person's gender as functioning as a type of collateral, you know, that a guarantor for, for the meanings of other uh, transactions or movements a person has in their life. Um, and, and just really quickly regarding the recommendation. So one is definitely accepting Tirunangi family structures and queer family structures, not forcibly returning people home reframing what counts as respectable work, um, especially when it comes to sex work. And the government should prioritize self-identification and ensure a continuity of documentation after person transition. So their educational qualifications don't become void and they're eligible for employment. And lastly, not just viewing people through a human rights or health framework, but as you know, viewing gender as a social and economic matter. And so focusing on needs like housing, credit, um, you know, safe migration, employment, and education. I understand that life costs more if you're, if you're uh, for some of my interlocutors, if you're queer or trans because of the, the support they forego. Great. Thank you, Shakti.
Um, so I'll, I'll actually move to Valentini uh, to you now because your your findings have uh, some resonance with what Shakti was speaking until now. Your your article is um, I, I thought was really about um, sex workers who are migrant, local, trans, cis, um, uh, refugees, and so on, any or internal migrants forming communities um, and chosen chosen families. So can you can you tell us a, a bit about that? What what you found around these chosen families and communities of care? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, my article is looking, as you said, at um, it's trying to kind of reposition all these discussions about violence, exploitation. Uh, it was a really prevalent when it comes to sex work and trafficking, but also um, I'm also looking at different processes of devaluation that happen in the Greek labor market at large. So I'm trying to look at these from the perspectives of the, the workers um, I'm you know, working with in the field and to kind of provide a different understanding of them than the classic trafficking framework. And then also, yeah, th that means kind of connecting them to state policies that produce these realities. And not least of that is the conditions of illegality that people are dealing with. And then um, I'm trying to look at how people kind of navigate these realities through community building and through different strategies that they develop among themselves and more on their own terms than what usually happens with state projects to rescue or rehabilitate people. So, yeah, so for example, yeah, so basically my article is about grassroots tactics and community building um, and how these are shared among different kinds of informal workers, but we are migrant uh, and local. Um, yeah, so for example, I, I tried to kind of do this on multiple levels. I'm looking at um, how, for example, I'm, I'm looking at the story of one interlocutor who's local. She's actually from Athens and she's a cis woman who kind of entered the sex industry she, as a street worker. Um, because she was divorced, she was a mother, she basically couldn't make ends meet. So she started uh, doing sex work. Um, and then she basically discussed how during her first years at work before she had formed the community and before she kind of had found her footing on the industry, that there was all these experiences of um, exploitation and also sexual violence that kind of went together. Um, which I think her story is really telling because one of the incidents she described was this man who was blackmailing her on the stroll in order to get free sex from her and posing as a policeman. So she eventually kind of started talking with other women. She started kind of, you know, um, going to the cafes and hanging out with people and kind of told them about that. And she realized the guy was scamming her. So she kind of got rid of him. but. It's interesting that to see how she was so recognizable as a precarious worker who's in public space and that therefore does not have any access to any, any kind of justice or protection. And also the reality of police abuse and rape is so widespread that other people can even, you know, take it up and pose as policemen to kind of take benefit from that. So it kind of illustrates this you know, a continuum of exploitation that extends from the state to the whole of the society, basically. So, yeah, that was one story that I found was quite telling in terms of how we usually talk about sexual violence and rape. Can you hear me? There is this. Yeah, yeah. It works in my neighborhood. Um, yeah, so this this kind of started started me thinking about how isolation is a really dangerous thing for a sex worker and how also meeting other workers can be kind of life-saving in a way and there were many other stories like that one another one was from another worker also street-based who had entered sex work in the 90s in a trans role along with some other trans women who were her friends and had been a had survived a really vicious attack by a client at some point who was later convicted for murdering three or four sex workers I think so after this attack, she was terrified. She took a break from sex work. She went to another city. She worked as a bartender and like 
yeah, took this break and then eventually she had to turn back and had no other choice but to work again on the stroll. And to describe this process, I think, I think was also really telling about how basically her friends, her, the women she had entered sex work with, who she described as her sisters and her chosen family, kind of helped her learn how to, how to work. And they were staying with her on the stroll while she was soliciting. They, they would like, take turns with their clients so she would never be alone on the street. But they would also arrange all these group dates for, for months on end so she could like be able to work and make a living but without feeling alone mm. um which i think is extremely um moving and you know it's again life sustaining and she she was la laughing about it and she said it was like an educational seminar um yeah so i'm i'm looking at all these different kinds of ways that people learned how to work in the first years of their on the job by working with others um and then i'm also trying to look at to connect this more so there is also exploitation there is violence there's the threat of death like you know get attempted murder but there's also all these state policies that kind of subject people to death or hyper exploitation indirectly and then i'm looking at the example of the lockdowns in greece so one of the lockdowns we had was lasted for six months sorry yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. basically I'm looking at all these different ways in which people kind of banded together as workers to kind of survive through different kinds of violence and exploitation. And then I kind of take apart some of the themes. So I'm looking at chosen families, so sisterhood, motherhood amongst trans, trans sex workers, um, and how this also relates to aging in the sex industry. Um, and I, and then, then I'm looking at more... Uh, mixed collaborations between folks who are, you know, uh, local trans women, queer migrant men, older and newer sex workers, different kinds of connections that emerge as people kind of deal with these realities together, and it, but also in differentiated ways. And that throughout the article, I'm trying to kind of show that there's not a romantic idea of community that's free of exploitation or economic concerns. But I'm trying to connect these to other ways of entering the sex industry or surviving, which are more usually legible as brokerage or even pimping and are criminalized as such. So I'm trying to kind of position this in a material sense. I don't know if that makes sense. I rambled on a bit. But yeah. <laughs> yes, great. Thank you so much, uh, Valentini. Uh, all right, Katya. Um, uh, so yeah, you, you you explained already how you you reviewed the cases of um, the asylum cases of gay men uh, in Russia. So what what were um, yeah and uh, so can you tell us what what were the reasons and, and they were all rejected. So what were the sort of the reasons, the thinking for rejection? Um, yeah. So so yeah, really the starting point of my research was that. Uh, in the experience of my organization and other organizations working with LGBT asylum seekers in Russia, there was no single case of uh, asylum being granted to an LGBT person. So we didn't see any. Um, and I was trying to understand in which context uh, this decision-making process takes place and how it's framed. Um, and so first I analyzed the Russian asylum system and I guess uh, the two main takeaways are that first it's not fully compliant with the Geneva Convention. Uh, there are certain um, provisions that are either lacking or contradict uh, the convention. And second, that there is an um, extremely low uh, number of positive decisions in general. So there are only 22 positive asylum um, decisions in 2020 and a few thousand of um, uh, temporary protection um, decisions being granted to asylum seekers in general, but no, no single LGBTQ asylum seeker. Um, then I turned to discussing the Russian politics of sexuality. So as I mentioned, um, uh, there's been a ban on uh, same-sex, so-called same-sex propaganda in 2014, uh, which led to the increase in violence against the LGBT community. Uh, but also um, it's very important how uh, this ban um, became a manifestation of the traditional values 
and discourse in Russia, and this discourse has um, um, really taken a big place um, in the political discourse in Russia in general. So I, uh, um, I discuss um, how this also had an impact, um, obviously, on the functioning of the um, asylum system in general as being a part of a um, more general administrative Russian system. Um, and then I turn to discussing the reasoning of the um, uh, migration uh, authorities and courts. And uh, here uh, there are two main um, elements um, that emerge. Uh, first element is that uh, in the first instance asylum decisions, uh, there is, uh, so what I, um, um, what I noticed while analyzing these decisions is that there is a complete um, lack um, of relevant country analysis. So when you read those decisions, I think one emblematic uh, decision that um, I was analyzing uh, is uh, the one concerning uh, Cameroon. Uh, so the decision cites um, a lot of um, country information such as eth ethnolinguistic uh, composition of the country, the length of the long longest river in the country, and a lot of irrelevant factors like this. Uh, but it fails to mention that homosexuality is criminal, criminalized in Cameroon, which is uh, the main uh, factor for, for this case. And uh, the factor that the applicant actually cited, uh, I was present at the interview, uh, and the applicant actually cited uh, this factor during his interview. And uh, this was not even mentioned in the uh, decision, um, in, in the decision of the immigration court. Uh, so there is a complete uh, failure to um, actually analyze relevant country information. And then the second element uh, that emerged during the analysis of the uh, appeal court decisions is that uh, at the appeal stage, uh, the courts um, actually indirectly um, acknowledge that uh, there is, uh, for example, criminalization in the countries of um, origin, because in um, uh, both in Sudan and in Cameroon, uh, same-sex um, activities are criminalized. Uh, so the courts actually acknowledge this, but then they proceed uh, to, uh, to state that uh, this is not uh, a sufficient reason in itself to grant asylum. And at the same time, there is a complete failure to actually um, analyze the personal circumstances of the applicant. So, um, and so, yeah, I try to demonstrate how this uh, results from those two systemic uh, factors that I discussed in the beginning from the uh, flawed um, nature of the asylum system in general in Russia, but also um, the politics of uh, sexuality. And uh, in terms of recommendations, um, well, personally, to me, the only realistic recommendation would really be, um, in terms of LGBTQ asylum refugees in Russia, would really be enhancing uh, third country solutions. And this is something uh, most uh, applicants who I talk to, they gradually come, even those who um, came to Russia, um, you know, um, without thinking this would be a country of transit, whose destination was actually, they were going to Russia to uh, stay there. They gradually come to realize uh, this is not um, a safe country for them. And not only in terms of uh, violence, they also face in Russia as well as uh, Russian LGBT community, uh, but uh, um, because they also face um, other risks such as deportation, they don't have any, um, well, access to social services is dependent, um, any access to social services is dependent on the person's legal status, so the, without um, uh, the legal status they cannot access any social services. Um, so, um, uh, yes, um, I guess, uh, to, to me, uh, the, the, the only realistic uh, recommendation would be uh, enhancing uh, third country solutions for those um, mm -hmm. this category of um, asylum seekers. Great, thank you, Katya. Um, and Antokozo, over to you. Uh, so uh, yeah, your article focuses on the experiences of, um, again, straight and gay cis and trans uh, migrant sex workers um, in South Africa. So do you, can you share briefly what uh, what experiences you documented? Okay, uh, thanks, Bobby, um, for that question. So, in terms of uh, the research study that informed this paper, 
uh, it's actually based on, on my PhD research project, which is um, the title is Queering Sex Work and Mobility in South Africa. So it probably paper adapted it to be Queering Sex Work and Mobility. So that's why for me, I, I worked with a um, mixed group of, of people um, because I was using the queering as a verb as a way of um, operationalizing the disruption that um, queer theory uh, kind of brings to, to a way of thinking about the world. And for me, it was uh, quite interesting um, in terms of the findings because I was more interested in what happens when you find migration, mobility, movement intersecting with sex work especially when it relates to gender and sexuality um, and which I read together as gendered sexualities. And what I found is that um, sex work in itself is a very conducive space in terms of exploring one's gender and sexuality in ways in which other spaces um, or forms of work or ways of being in the world might not necessarily allow. And this is uh, not only because uh, sex work entails you engaging in different forms of uh, sexual acts with different types of people. So your body becomes exposed to different ways of experiencing sexual pleasure and displeasure. Um, but that, that also kind of ends up informing your body's own vocabulary and that later on can help inform who you end up finding sexually attractive, not only in your line of work, but also in your intimate life. So for me, it was quite interesting to find um, uh, some of the respondents talking about how when they initially entered sex work, they self-identified as like, I'm a strictly cisgender heterosexual woman and I only service male clientele. But then later on in engaging in sex work and having clients requesting like threesomes or lesbian shows, um, they found themselves being exposed to different ways of having sex. And one of the participants was even like, I actually found that I enjoy being with women sexually. And now I'm not sure, am I lesbian? Am I sexual? Am I this, am I that? And so that was one of the main findings that came out of the study but also in terms of the migration and mobility uh, aspect most of the participants highlighted the fact that this exploration and experimentation would not have been possible if they were doing the sex work within their immediate uh, communities where their families could see them or even in their countries for some of the participants who are external migrants and so we, i found that moving away or move any form of movement or migration brings the element of anonymity which was also mentioned by one of the contributors in this webinar where the participant does not have to uh, worry about being found out by their family and therefore ostracized uh, for selling sex or for being uh, gender sexually non-conforming so for me it was quite interesting to 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 find that actually mobility and movement migration plays such a significant role uh, when it comes to the exploration and experimentation that takes place within sex work itself. Um, and then I also wanted to try and, uh, oh, in terms of the recommendations. So the main recommendation that I'll make, even though it's not in the paper itself, but based on, on the, the findings is the need for decriminalization of sex work. Because even though in South Africa, we do have a very uh, strong constitution which protects um, your uh, sexual rights and your gender rights. And also we have the Refugee Act, which allows persons to, to be granted uh, a refugee status uh, on the basis of um, fleeing perhaps sexual or gender persecution. We find that all of these rights are kind of like trumped because sex work is criminalized. So even when you are a South African citizen who has an identity document, you find that you struggle to access certain rights like healthcare uh, because you are known to be a sex worker. So for me, um, what the study allowed me to do is to kind of revisit um, citizenship, specifically sexual citizenship uh, from the lens of sex work, which kind of like allows us to queer 
to queer citizenship in the sense that we now need to also be cognizant that even though we might have these other policies in place which seem to be protecting the rights of, of sex workers or um, external migrants or refugees or whatnot but because these bodies kind of like come together in, in this space um, we need to also be aware that sex work needs to be decriminalized. Otherwise, these other laws and policies might as well not exist because they're not necessarily protecting the people they're meant to be. And then I also want to just to jump in. There was a question around methodology. And for me, the methodology that I use and which I've used in previous studies is the feminist participatory action research methodology. I won't go into too much detail about it. You can go and research more about it. But basically, it is driven by feminist principles of equality. And also, it's about engagement. And, and so the, the people that you work with in the study, the participants are seen not just as uh, respondents people will give you like answers or data but they're seen as intellectual partners in, in in the research project so the way in which i went about it is apart from using um digital storytelling and whatsapp uh as ways in which to 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 generate that engagement uh within the participants themselves but i also hired uh two research assistants who are also part of the the participant group one was a, a zimbabwean migrant and the other an internal uh, South African mobile sex worker. And for me, that was very important because there were, we, we really tried to foster uh, more of a co-researcher kind of relationship than rather uh, PI and research assistance kind of dynamic because I wanted to push the FPAR envelope because when we talk about engagement, it shouldn't just be tokenistic, but we should actually recognize the the intellectual input that our participants are bringing. So we we would read our literature together. We would craft the weekly exercises together with the research assistants. And for me, it was quite helpful because sometimes I would read literature, which I, I had no idea how to translate into uh, an exercise for that week that will help the participant engage with these themes that are complex around gender, sexuality, and this and that. And it helped to really have um, the two research assistants because they were able to speak from the embodied lived experience. And that's the kind of wisdom that you can't read anywhere. And so I would advise anyone who's trying to engage vulnerable populations in research to explore that methodology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ntokozo. Um, and, and for answering one of the questions. So before we we um, answer the other question, um, I want to turn back, go back to Swati um, with uh, one last question. Um, so um, so what would you say are the the implications of queer and trans theory for rethinking how we understand the critiques of the mainstream anti-trafficking uh, uh, movement or framework? Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I will um, I will try to address that quickly and, and also the, the other question, and hopefully these two answers will go together. Um, I think as uh, our uh, the authors who've, who've spoken uh, so uh, eloquently for the last hour and a half. Um, one of the things that queer and trans theory contributes to this discussion is to really unsettle um, these categories that we think are naturalized and normalized and that have existed for all time. Um, the uh, categories that we uh, consider to be timeless, like gender, sexuality, the identitarian categories within oh. those frameworks are actually deeply historical, they're deeply material, they have not existed forever. And I think something that um, all of these papers collectively do in drawing from queer and trans theory is to unsettle these rubrics. So um, nobody is dealing with easy binaries, Nobody is uh, talking about victims and agents. Um, nobody is talking about um, citizens and non-citizens. Um, there, there is a lot of binary unsettling that's going on here. And uh, from a certain perspective, 
that's very queer and that is very um, trans and it's sort of it's it's approach to these categories in a very processual way and there are much more um, eloquent elaborations of this in the special issue of course but broadly I would say there's a lot of unsettling going on in a good way in these in these papers. Um, this sort of relates to uh, the first question in the in the Q and A about you know the kind of social networks that people access and uh, this this question of illegalization and um, if you heard uh, particularly in Jackie's um, kind of telling of their paper um, the informal economy is a space where people who are criminalized on the basis of their gender or sexuality can find some sort of a livelihood and that's always been true that you know that these, these informal illegalized spaces um, are are places where people can survive um, for whatever reason I don't want to say you know if you can't get a real job then you go there it, it, again that binary doesn't always work these are very you know ultimately individual and idiosyncratic decisions that people make based on their own circumstances but nevertheless the informal economy has been that kind of a, a space. Um, at the same time, and I, I address this a little bit in the introduction uh, that I wrote for the special issue, the, um, the politics of illegalization has been something that's been in the air for um, discussions about sex work since at least the 1970s and perhaps longer. Um, the, the 70s and American feminism were a time when people were really kind of playing with the idea of being outlaws. And uh, there was a lot of common cause that sex workers and feminists and marriage resistors were making amongst um, each other. And some of those alliances and that kind of the political force uh, of those that moment was lost in, in my view in the 80s and in the 90s. And I think it's interesting that we're coming back to a, a place where it seems natural again to be talking about queerness in the same context as sex work. And that was something that was, those two things were really separated in the wake of the American uh, debates on pornography and the reification of trafficking that happened afterwards. So I think this is a really interesting and exciting moment in which we could think again uh, with the concept of, of non-normity, of non-heteronormity, of kind of the, the space that most of us exist in that does not reify these binary categories and that, you know, frankly, don't work for most people. So I'll leave it there. Um, the one thing I wanted to say methodologically is that uh, for those of you who read the special issue, if you notice, um, most of the papers are coming from a, a social science perspective methodologically as well, in the sense that everybody spent time somewhere, everybody talked to somebody, not every single paper, but the papers do come from that sensibility. And um, behind it is a lot of really deep and um, and, and uh, sincere thought about how to do ethical research with people and, and embedded within communities. And I, I think that comes across very well too. Thank you, Swati. Um, I was also thinking, uh, you know, with respect to the first question, which was asked, um, that, yeah, one, one um, I, I mean, why LGBT people engage with um, uh, sex work and, uh, yeah, for sure. One reason is uh, the fact that he, when they are criminalized, when their uh, uh, identity is criminalized, sex work maybe allows uh, foreign income. But also for uh, what what Tokozo was uh, was saying, it allows for experimentation and for um, you know even overcoming stigma and. Um, uh, and new new sensations, basically. Um, and on one hand, for uh, for LGBT people who offer sexual services for money, but also for um, people who buy sexual who, or who pay for sex um, to in order to uh, experience new um, uh, new sensations, let's say, or to uh, yeah to to realize their sexuality. Um, so that. I mean, that's all from me, but I'll, um, and we are after um, 
above our uh, planned time. But if anyone wants to, to answer also these two questions that we had in the chat box, or maybe we have a third now. Um, we, we do have a third now. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I work in the anti-trafficking system in Italy, as well as in Association for Queer Migrants in Italy, often collaborating with sex worker rights organizations and groups. Uh, and I deal with permits, of, with uh, yeah, residence permits uh, for asylum. Okay, <laughs> would like to keep in contact. Oh, okay, okay, we will. I will note your email and say hi after the event. Thank you. So does anyone else want to answer the two questions or share some final words before we close? Um, I wanted to speak to the methodological question as well. Uh, so I found that one thing that helped me was understanding the history of social science methods in that specific place so that the kinds of data I was collecting or the exercises I was doing, uh, I could understand how they were couched for my interlocutors. And because of the kind of problematic space of um, first person narratives there, I tried to avoid putting people in a position of confession or being a spokesperson. And I think especially because at the time, uh, you know, homosexuality was criminalized, but I, I was engaged in this space for over 10 years. So this was over a long period of time, but, uh, and, you know, sex work, I didn't really want to ask people, I, I want, so it helped a lot to have meta conversations about the circulation of life stories or engage them in their capacity as authors and activists and people who circulated stories with with complex ends in mind rather than i think just reducing them to you know uh you know people testifying to an experience of injury and i think the the what helped about that was also to identify the unevenness of what we think of as vulnerability i mean there were people who on the one hand could be published and very widely circulated but also not be having a stable income or housing um, you know, and, and so people experienced a real paradox in that way. And even trans women, I mean, at the time, the situation was such that transgender identity was affirmed by the government, but uh, intercourse that was not heterosexual, which this colonial language defined as against the order of nature, you know, this was criminalized. So even legally, people occupied a very a contradictory space where you know the kind of sex you were having was criminal possibly but your supposed identity was celebrated and you're regularly invited as a spokesperson to government events so i think people also didn't put like being wholly characterized as a vulnerable population as as such and, and so i think bringing them in in this way as co-analyzers of uh language you know one helped show ethnographically in tamil nadu in tamil uh, culture like what is the um, that sounds really reifying but what is the kind of relationship between meaning and speech how does one understand something that's narrated in a certain way it's not the same as in english for example it's in relation to other genres in that space uh, uh, you know why do people choose to say their story as poetry and or as a short story and not um, an academic monograph perhaps and it sort of allowed people to theorize the findings with me and over the years i think consulting with people about my translations and about my analysis has kind of been uh you know really really rewarding uh, and in terms of yeah trans theory i think as you've all been saying just not adopting gender binaries or or fixed gender categories as part of method from a very very early stage in a research project and i kind of appreciate what you were all saying about um finding other axes on which to recruit participants for example deliberately avoiding call uh, interpolating them as this category um yeah, and hopefully this will all counter what Swati also mentioned as this kind of really virulent and troubling transphobic kind of cis feminism that is 
unfortunately resurging in, in a big way and the kind of concomitant uh, naturalization, not only of gender, but also the complete misrecognition that woman is, it's, is not a universal or shared category for even people who are cisgendered uh, in certain contexts. And so yeah, that's a big point. Um, Bobby, I know we're um, 10 minutes over, but I wanna um, just two seconds to say that um, I think these methodological um, insights are also coming from the fact that anybody who does any kind of research with people who do sex work are doing research with people who are heavily researched. This is one of the most researched populations anywhere in the world, um, especially in places where sex workers gather, strolls, brothels, um, clinics, the, you know, along with sex workers and uh, clients, the streets are thick with researchers and NGO workers and social workers and doctors and, 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 and. So I think that methodologically speaking, everybody needs to read research on sex work because research on sex work is very self-aware and has to deal with all of these kind of narratological issues that I think are, um, about research itself. Thank you, um, everyone, so much for your contributions and everyone who came to, to listen to this event. Um, well, that's the end. Um, and yeah, uh, visit uh, the, the journal website check out the past issues, the, the call for papers for future issues. And again, thank you everyone for speaking about your articles. Good night now uh, and have a great day. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. Stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.